welcome back to Redland Online and Happy New Year to all of you. I hope that you enter this new year with hope in your hearts as you anticipate being able to see people again and just hug people and just spontaneously go out and do stuff again. But I also hope that this will be a year that's marked because Jesus does great things in your lives and that this year will be very significant for you. It's also the season of Epiphany that we're marking today. Epiphany is the time of year when we journey with the kings, the three wise men, as they go and find the baby Jesus in the stable. And it's a season which celebrates revelation and how Jesus' light and Jesus' good news, the gospel, is just revealed to the whole world. And Tori is going to be exploring what that means for us later on in this online service. In a moment we're going to pray, we're going to pray a short prayer for this season of Epiphany and the words will appear on the screen and then after that we're going to worship Jesus through music and Katie is going to lead us today. So let's pray. Creator of the heavens, who led the wise men by a star to worship Jesus, the Christ child, guide and sustain us that we may find our journey's end in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you. It's good to keep a short account with God, so we're going to come into his presence now for restoration and forgiveness. Think of any area in which you might want to come to God and confess something or share something, because he always wants to forgive you. Christ came in humility to share our lives. Forgive our pride. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ came with good news for all people. Forgive our silence. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ came in love to a world of suffering Forgive our self-centeredness. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Almighty God, who in Jesus Christ has given us a kingdom that cannot be destroyed, forgive us our sins, open our eyes to God's truth, strengthen us to do God's will, and give us the joy of his kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Good morning. Um, Happy New Year to you all. It's great to be with you this morning. Um, and happy Epiphany. So today is Epiphany Sunday in the church calendar and it's the day when we traditionally read the story of when the three kings in Matthew's Gospel went to visit uh, baby Jesus. The reason that it's such a celebration is that the three kings came from far off. They represent Um, the whole world, um, particularly the non-Jewish world. Um, And so the celebration is that Jesus is not just for the Jews in Israel, but he is for all of us. And we're going to hear some more about that this morning. Now, you may be thinking, I'm done with celebrating. Christmas has uh, finished now. I'm just looking forward to taking my decorations down. In fact, maybe you've already taken your decorations down. Um, You don't want to eat another mince pie. You don't even want to look at another mince pie. And perhaps you're just counting down the days until the children can go back to school and life can resume a somewhat normal pattern to it. However, we're going to have a look at this passage today in Matthew's Gospel, uh, the story of the, um, the three kings or the three wise men who go and visit Jesus. And as we scratch the surface of this uh, passage a little bit, what we're going to find is that it's not just a cute Christmas story that we kind of pull out every year, but actually there's something amazing taking place here. And there's a cosmic battle occurring between good and evil that we're going to find out a little bit more about. So before we continue, let's have our reading. Uh, My husband Brian's going to do the reading and as you listen, just count, how many kings or kingly characters can you hear um, in this passage? Reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, verse 1 to 12. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who was born who has been born King of the Jews? 
We saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem and Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. When Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared, he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. So how many kingly characters did you find in the reading that we just had? Um, I debated a bit, but I think if I group them, I found three. So if you also found three, maybe give yourself some leftover Christmas chocolate or an old mince pie. Um, and we're going to take a look at what those three kings are and what they represent to us in this cosmic battle um, between good and evil. The three kings that I found were King Herod, the Magi, I'm grouping them together as, as one king figure, and King Jesus. Let's take a look at um, those figures. So, first of all, King Herod. Now, in this cosmic battle, King Herod represents evil. He is um, insatiably jealous and suspicious of anybody around him that might try to take his power. He is um, a murderer. Later on he goes on to murder his wife, his sons, his mother-in-law. Um, this man is somebody who will do nothing at all to stop those who get in his way, including killing, harming and hurting people. What we get from this particular passage um, is how he tries to deceive and manipulate the Magi. <clears throat> he tells them he wants to worship Jesus, a lie. He tries to manipulate them to come back. Thankfully, they don't. Um, so this representation of evil is what the Bible descripts, uh, depicts um, when we read about Satan. Satan is the father of lies. He comes to kill, steal and destroy. And that's exactly what Herod is doing. Alongside this deception, he also wants to kill Jesus. He wants to steal Jesus's rightful title and he wants to destroy the kingdom of God that will come with the rising Messiah. So that's Herod. He represents evil. Next, we have the Magi. Now, the Magi actually can represent ourselves, and we'll take a look at sort of what that means for us. But first off, let's answer a couple of questions. Sometimes they're referred to as the three kings. Now, how do we know that there were three of them? The answer is we don't. The Bible doesn't say how many there are. The only reason they're referred to as the three um, is because they, they're three gifts that are bought, so people have presumed there might be three. In fact, the early church used to think that there were twelve, so we just don't know. As for them being referred to as kings, this comes from Old Testament prophecy, uh, particularly in Isaiah and Psalm 72, where it talks about how kingly visitors or kingly dignitaries from the east will come and bring gifts to the one who will be the ruler of all nations 
a prophetic text talking about how the the wise men, the magi, will bring gifts to Jesus and an acknowledgement that Jesus is going to be the king of all nations. That's Matthew's point here, not just to the Jews in um, Israel, but to all nations. That means for me and for you as well. Now, the Magi were amazing. Can you imagine today? I want to go and follow a star and listen to my dreams and take a prophecy from the Bible and kind of stick to it literally. That's what these guys did. They were crazy dream star prophecy following guys. They left their, their homes to go on an epic journey um, to a destination they did not know, to a people group they really did not know. The only thing they probably did know is that they were heading to Jerusalem, which is where you would expect um, the new king of Israel to be born, because they were looking for a new birth, a new royal birth, because that's what stars at that point in time indicated. Now, what is thought is that they were probably a mixture of astrologers, philosophers, maybe scientists, who in those days, those professions meant that they were seekers after God, because in the astrology, in science and in philosophy, people would seek um, intervention in their lives from the divine. So they were seekers of God, albeit a bit sort of on the fringes of what we might think of um, today. So these were amazing and radical guys. Um, now, what I want to remind us as well is not to confine the, the miracles that they were following to kind of the, the graveyard of Bible history that some might say, because the God that they were seeking and that was guiding them is the same God that guides me today. And it's the same God, if you're a believer, that guides you too. So therefore, he doesn't change, which means miracles still happen. Miraculous events still happen. God can still speak to us and does speak to us through visions and dreams and prophecy. The Bible still speaks to us today, just as it spoke to those magi back then. Now, the thing that is really interesting and um, is the magi had to make a decision at every point along the way whether they were going to follow um, the next sign that they saw, whether it was the prophecy, the dream or the star. Um, and that's kind of like our walk um, as Christians is at every point God will speak to us in different ways and we have to be alert for those different ways just as the, the Magi were um, and we have a decision at every point as a Christian am I going to continue in this way do I want to continue to listen to what God's going to say and what he is saying to me what am I going to do am I going to act on that and these guys are a model for us they acted um, as a yes in response to everything that God showed them. And as a result, they were blessed. They got close enough to touch Jesus. And that's something that as Christians, when we hear God, when we listen to him, we can get close enough to touch Jesus and let him, importantly, touch us. Now, one thing I found very challenging about these wise men is that there's a powerful contrast that's taking place with the Magi. They, um, the Magi, if we contrast them with the priests and the teachers in Herod's palace, the Magi were the outsiders to the faith in comparison to the, these priests who were the insiders um, to the faith. The Magi came from hundreds of miles away yet they came close enough to touch Jesus. These priests who were supposed to um, be close to God actually were so far from him. Even though they were six miles down the road, they didn't even bother to try and search for him, even though they knew the scriptures, they knew where um, they were expecting he would be born. <coughs> the Magi 
were these crazy star following guys that I've talked about. The priests did nothing. The priests knew everything about the scriptures. They had all the answers on the tip of their tongue, but yet they went on to conspire to kill Jesus. The Magi knew very little about the scriptures, yet Jesus changed their hearts. The priests were educated, but were fools. The Magi were fools for God, and that is what made them wise men. Now, the challenge that I found about that is that when I reflected on it, I am an insider in the faith, <clears throat> kind of like the priests. I'm comfortable in church, I go to church when it's open, I, um, I read my Bible, I know some of the stories, I've got some Christian friends, um, and it led me to question, am I like the priests who were just comfortable in their faith, they had the right answers, they know how to sound religious, they were had their religious busyness, but yet, Am I unlike the Magi who had a heart to seek the true King? They had a heart to seek after God. And so that challenged me. What in the ways that I'm acting as a Christian, where am I truly seeking God in some of the religious activity that I'm involved in? And if I'm not seeking God in the things that I'm doing, then it sent me back to prayer to think about, God, what is it you're asking? Is there a star, a metaphor metaphorical star that you are asking me to follow so that I can find you and be closer to you? So that's the Magi. They represent us and the decisions that we have to make on our Christian walk that enable us to get close to God. Finally, um, is Jesus, King Jesus. Now, of course, Jesus is the true King. He represents all that is good in this cosmic battle, everything that is good and therefore of God. Now, before we kind of really look a little bit at Jesus, I think one of the things that I then struggled with here was thinking, if Jesus is King, and he's all powerful, created everything, he sits on his throne at the right hand of God. Um, how do I connect that and put that together with the Jesus I hear about who is humble and poor and gentle and a servant? Um, and one way that I found helpful that somebody's previously told to me is it's kind of like the Queen. The Queen in our country I can't get close to her. I can't phone her. I can't email her. I can't just go and knock on her door. I can't just chat with her. Um, even if she was to invite me to talk to her, I would still have to go through so much ritual to be able to um, to even get close. I, I'd have to think about, well, do I shake hands? What's the correct title that I have to use for her? And maybe that's some people's perception of what God feels like, that there's so much ritual that they can't get close to God in they can't get close to Jesus <clears throat> however our King Jesus is also part of our family when we become a Christian we become part of the family of God and just like the Queen the people that can get close to her are her children her great children her great sorry, her grandchildren, her great-grandchildren, they can come close to her, they can chat with her, they can give her a cuddle, they can talk with her casually, they can be supported by her and support her. And that is what happens when we are part of the family of God, King Jesus, who is royalty, who does sit on the throne, who is the true king, also is um, part of family. He's my brother. I am, in, I am part of the family of God. So Jesus, who um, represents 
God in sorry who represents good in these um, in this passage is the absolute antidote to the evil king Herod that we heard about at the beginning Herod being the false king Jesus being the true king and Jesus um, is so in contrast he was born in poverty Herod was born in a palace Herod his title was given to him by men whereas Jesus has all power and authority because he is God and no man can take it from him he is the ultimate king Herod did everything he could to hang on to his power. Jesus's power as king is just because of who he is and nothing could take that away from him. He was so secure in his power, he didn't have to display it. Now importantly as well, King Jesus will come again. His work is not done. And the Bible speaks about how when Jesus comes again, he will come as a more kingly figure and he will and everybody will bow the knee to Jesus. He will be recognisable as king to everybody, Christian and non-Christian. The final conclusion to this battle, the final winner is a foregone conclusion. Jesus wins. King Jesus will overcome every work of evil. <clears throat> One of the um, amazing ways that we can see that God is the winner in this battle is um, how he uses the miraculous signs that we've talked about earlier. So if you wanted to demonstrate your ultimate power and authority over everybody, one of the ways that you can do it is to do things that other people can't do that they're not capable of doing so king jesus god uses stars prophecies visions dreams herod cannot breathe a prophecy to light uh, to life he can't put dreams in people's minds he certainly can't control the stars god can and what god is doing by using those and Matthew is drawing our attention to it um, in this this passage is he's saying God is ultimately all-powerful and here's the evidence of it God is the one who will overcome evil there is no work of the enemy that can thwart um, God's plans King Jesus is on the throne will come again and there is nothing that evil can do to get in the way because God knows everything that is to take place. The key to it for us is like the Magi, what are we going to do about it? Are we going to be seekers after God and play our part because God loves it when we play our part and he blesses us just as he blessed those Magi when they could get close enough to touch Jesus. So who is your king who do you want to be your king if you say that jesus is already your king then this next video that we're going to watch will be a celebration of everything that you know about jesus as your king if you don't know jesus is your king or you're not sure or you think he was but you want to to recommit yourself to Jesus as the one true king. As we watch this next video, think about the things in your life that maybe you want to, to give over to the king, to say, yeah, you're in charge, you're the one that can move the stars. Will you help in my life with these things? <clears throat> or maybe there's an element of his character that we'll, that we'll watch in this video, um, that you think, Jesus, I need that. Will you help me with that? You are the king who still serves and still loves to serve us and meet our needs. Hang on to that characteristic. Jesus will hear you and meet your needs. So, <clears throat> the video that we are about to watch is from uh, an African-American uh, preacher who um, comes from the era of the civil rights movement in the sort of 60s, 70s and 80s in the United States. His name is Dr. Uh, Lockridge and he preaches on the character of the 
King Jesus um, in a way that I possibly couldn't replicate. Um, yeah, enjoy. The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I wonder do you know him? My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he beautifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's a key to knowledge. He's a wellspring of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's a highway of holiness. He's a gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is lighter. I could describe him for so yet he's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. Well, you can't get him out of your mind. You see, you can't get him off of your hand. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. As we journey with the kings to seek the face of Jesus and also begin a new year, Lord, would you warm our hearts through prayer. We pray for the swift and effective rollout of the COVID vaccines and that these would be available for everyone and also that they would work against any mutations of the virus. We pray for our new relationship with the European Union the political ties may have changed radically, but we pray for ongoing cooperation, for trade relationships to be good, and for harmony generally, particularly in dealing with the present pandemic. For this new season in the US, with the opportunities it brings, we ask that you bless President-elect Biden and his team as they seek to control the pandemic. Give them great determination and wisdom as they show much needed leadership on the world stage with climate change and stewardship of creation generally. And for each of us, 
We pray for a deeper intimacy with our Dad, as Jesus teaches us to call him, for lives to be led better, for the fruit of the Holy Spirit to be revealed in us. Ask yourself how you fit into that picture, that story of the three kings visiting Jesus. Are you able to worship him as they did? Are you able to offer him the things that are most precious to you? May our New Year's resolutions be rooted in you, Jesus, and so be achievable and sustainable. And now we say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
We're coming to the end of our online service now, but I really hope and pray that your vision of the scope of Jesus' gospel has been expanded by what you've heard today as you've journeyed with the three wise men. And we're going to be resuming our Zoom coffee shortly at 11.30, so do join us. It would be great to see you at that. And keep in touch with each other. Reach out to each other. If you can think of somebody who could do with a phone call this week, just pick up the phone. And if you want to speak to somebody, don't hesitate to pick up the phone and call them or call a friend. But I'm going to end now with a prayer for this season, a prayer of reassurance, which you might want to say with me. As I say it, the words will be on the screen. The God who breathes this world alive and sustains it day by day, whose hands flung stars into space and controls our destiny, says, Do not be afraid, for I am with you. The God who filled the ocean depths and set the tides on their way, who caused mountains to be raised up, says, I have called you by name, you are mine. The God who made the fertile earth and seed to sow, whose artistry creates the early morning frost and dew, this God, Father, Son and Spirit, says, You are precious in my sight. Goodbye. <laughs>